I wanted to look at today is, is kids in general. And this is what I'm going to talk about, really, going into the new year, is exactly this. Is how do we go into the new year like a child? And you might say to yourself, well, why is that even important? Well, I'll show you why it's important. Um, first, what I want to say is we don't want to go into the new year as a child to be childish, not to be childish, because there's already passages that talk about the fact that you don't want to be childish. This is one of them right here. In Proverbs 22, have you guys done this one yet? Proverbs 22, 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it from him. Ugh. So we don't want to go into the new year being foolish like children. Another place in the New Testament, Paul writes Ephesus, and he says, you know, as a result, we're no longer to be children. We don't want to be children that is tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. So he says right there, it's wrong to be like a child if being like a child is the fact that you can be easily manipulated by doctrine that's kind of off base. You need to be really insightful about the doctrine. So don't be a child in that sense. So why do we want to be a child going into the new year? Well, because of this phrase right here. This should scare you a little bit. Jesus said, truly I say to you, unless you're converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't say anything like that in the whole rest of the Bible. He doesn't say, well, unless you're really kind to each other, you won't enter the kingdom or unless, you know. He, this is one of the few places he states it so strongly. Unless be, they become converted, and I'm not talking about spiritual conversion, I'm talking about something's got to change is what he's saying. Unless something changes in you, you adults is, what, is the implied point. Unless you become more like children, you're not going to enter the kingdom. <laughs> so this isn't just an advisory thing he says here. This is critical to your salvation. What? Yes. Isn't that amazing? So let's take a look. I remember that verse, and I thought, we've got to look at this more closely, because as I've read this in the past, I've took it sort of as, well, yeah, we can be childlike, and that's wonderful. Ho, ho, you're this well. No, it's critical. So let's find out how it's critical and why. So let's take a look at the places. If you look in the, in the Bible where Jesus talks about children, you'll find that there's two events that happen that are repeated in the Gospels. One event, which is repeated in these three Gospels, uh, is where parents and other adults bring the kids to Jesus. And it shows up in, in these passages here. We're going to look at one of them, Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Luke 18. And then there's another event that happens where Jesus brings children to the apostles. What? Yes. You don't know about this one? Uh, you, you might recognize it. You'll see in a second. So he brings children to the apostles. It's in Matthew 18 and Luke 9. So in our adventure, we're going to start right here on Matthew 18 because I, what I just quoted in the beginning there about being converted and being like children, that comes from Matthew 18. So let's go right to that first so we can all breathe a sigh of relief. Okay? Uh, let's take a look at this. So here we go. Matthew 18, verse 1. He says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Which, by the way, this is why it's really nice to have different versions of the Bible. I mean, not versions, different, different accounts in the Gospels, because this is also covered in another Gospel. And you know what it says right there? They weren't just discussing the theoretical notions of who's the greatest. You know what they were doing? Luke tells us right here. An argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. <laughs> so they're in, this, they're in this battle with each other saying, who's greatest? I'm greatest. No, you're not. You're not the greatest. Well, yeah, I'm the first one that he called. And I, I know more about Jesus than you do. And I know the scriptures. And I, oh, I don't think so. You're one of those zealots. You want to overthrow. And they were having this argument right here about who's the greatest amongst them. So Jesus figures, okay, how do we quell this stupid argument? And this is how he does it with children. So he called a child to himself. So, you know, technically the child wasn't even close by. He calls a child to himself and he set him before them, puts the child in front of him. And then he says to them, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Verse four, whoever then humbles himself as this child, he's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So what's the key issue? Is it about being childish and foolish? What's the issue that they're dealing with that unless they shed it, it actually imperils their salvation? You see what it is? Look at it closely. It's that thing on the left. This sense about the fact that I am important, I am accomplished, I'm better than you. It's basically a, it's a great statement of just pride. It's pride is all it is. 
who is more, feels they're more accomplished, they've done more things, they can put more stuff on their list of things that they've accomplished and checked off. They're better at this, they're accomplished at this, they're more worthy than this. And they had this argument about the fact that some of them were seemingly more accomplished than the others, and somehow that made a difference in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, nope, you have to lose that entire argument to get into the kingdom. You have to lose that, totally. In fact, the one thing about children, especially smaller children he's talking about, and I think he picked a small child. I mean, I think he picked a child who was probably, you know, five or six or somewhere around there as opposed to one who's 13. Because <laughs> when you start getting in your teens, it starts to change. But the littlest kids, littlest kids, they already know that they are young and they have no status. They, they seem to know that they're sort of at the bottom of the rung. They have nothing to boast about, really. They're just there and they're happy to be there. You know what I'm talking about? That, that kind of childishness about your pride and your humility, that's what Jesus is getting at right here. If, if you approach the gates of heaven saying, I'm one of the greatest that ever lived on earth in terms of the kingdom of God, God will say, forget it. No, and there's nothing you can bring to change that. And the rest of the Gospels is very consistent. The only thing that accrues to our account in terms of salvation is what Jesus accomplishes on our behalf, not what we accomplish for ourselves. And what the apostles are arguing about is who's the most accomplished. And a child doesn't do that. The one who lives in us. Yes, the one who lives in us. The, the Spirit and Christ lives in us. He does that through us. So it's a, it's a whole different thing. And I, and I might just offer this for a second. If, if you're in, uh, in a congregation or a religion or some kind of situation, a spiritual situation, where there does seem to be a pecking order based on your accomplishments, then you're probably sitting on the left side of this page. And Jesus is saying that pecking order, that accomplishment is not going to get you anywhere. You have to be more like a child in that sense, where you have, you have no accomplishments, you have no reputation, you, act, you have nothing you can claim for. Yeah. Exactly. Children are dependent. Yeah. So you'll see this contrast coming up even more in a second. There really is, it gets to the heart of this lack of pride is actually an increasing dependence on God himself. So you really have one of two sides in life. You can depend on yourself and live on the left side of this slide and argue amongst yourselves about who's more accomplished and who's less accomplished based on what you can do. Or you can say, no, in a childlike kind of way, I can do a lot of things, but you know what? Uh, I'd rather just not worry about what I accomplish and what I can do in making myself worthy. That's really not the issue. That's not the issue. I want to be more like a child. That is, I'm more on the receiving end of life. I'm less on the side of life where I boast about what I've accomplished and what I've done. Because no child struts into a room and starts, you know, in, in, in light conversation, starts telling you about their great accomplishments. Well, now when they get to about 12 or 13, it changes. <laughs> then it gets really bad. It's, it's actually quite bad. But when you get in a mixed room of adults in a social situation, which we've had just at Christmas, one of the first things they start doing is listing for you the things that they've accomplished, usually most recently. Well, this year I did... Blah, 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 blah. We, we used to live in the San Francisco Bay Area. In the San Francisco Bay Area, we lived in Palo Alto in the shadow of Stanford University, the heart of Facebook and Google. So this is a, this is a highly accomplished kind of place. And the people you'd run into there, whenever you would talk to them socially, you'd say, so... You know, what do you, what do you do? What have you accomplished? Well, I started a $4 billion company this year, you know, and, uh, and we did a stock, you know, release. And, and, and then they just talk about all these accomplishments. And if in, in the Bay Area, if you don't have accomplishments, you're nothing. In church and in the kingdom of heaven, accomplishments don't mean anything. They just don't mean anything. It's what he does through us and in us and on our behalf that counts. And we'll see more about that. So dependence is a big issue. Jesus says you're going to have to lose this. If you don't lose this, it actually imperils your salvation. Oh, yeah. If it's all about what you do, all about what you accomplish, and all about how comparatively speaking to other people, I do more than others, hence I'm greater or more worthy. Jesus says you got to lose that. You've got to be more like a little child who comes in the room and says, I'm just happy to be here. Really, almost. And we're, we're going to look at that a little bit more closely in a second here. You have to humble yourself like a child. Now, I, I want to highlight this just for a second because a child doesn't normally humble themselves in terms of you telling them, be humble. I've said that to my teenagers, but I've never said that to a little child. Be humble. So what is he getting at when he says be humble? When you hear the word humble, unfortunately in our culture, humble means thinking less of yourself than you are. 
It means going down as low as possible. I can be more humble than you because I'm not going to talk about anything I've ever done. That's how humble I'm going to be. No, humble biblically, and I mean, don't ever forget this. Humble in a biblical sense means to just represent yourself for who you are. Not any bigger and not any smaller. It's just that who you are is who you say you are. That's really all humility is. It's not thinking more of yourself, and it's also on the flip side, not thinking less than of yourself. It's really just being level, <laughs> just level. So when someone asks you how you are or what you've done or where you come from, you don't have to make it big. You don't have to make it inappropriately small. You say, this is the way it is. It's just, it's just the normal level you. That's humble. So when people come to you and they start boasting about the things that they've done, they're elevating themselves. They're, they're what the biblically we call it, puffing that up. <laughs> like a balloon and you're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Let me tell you everything. I, no. You've got to be back to normal. That's what humble is. A child almost instinctively knows that when you ask them who they are or what they've done, they'll just tell you something very simple. This is me. This is me. And there's something so attractive about that in a child. That's one of the things I love about children. When you talk to children, uh, they'll just usually, uh, again, beneath a certain age, because <laughs> they start turning into adults somewhere in those teen years. But they're, they're just, not just innocent, but they're just straight talkers. They'll just, they'll just tell you the way things are. They'll tell you how ugly you look. They'll tell you how everything is just, you know, the way it is. Way, way back when, you know, Art Linkletter, way back when, used to have a show where you talk to kids, and you just love it because you never knew what they were going to say, but what they said was usually right on. I mean, it was straight. Adults, we learn how to not to speak straight to each other. But kids, just, pfft, just right there. There it is. There's something very refreshing about that. And that's what he's saying. Just be you. No bigger, no smaller. Just be you, okay? We'll talk more about that in a second. Let's go over this passage. The other passage is where the parents are bringing children to Jesus. And this is more, this is more familiar to many of us. But I love in these three parallel accounts, I love Mark's particularly because he adds one little phrase the others don't. So here it goes, Mark 10, 13. They were bringing children to him so that he might touch them. <clears throat> but the disciples rebuked them. <laughs> and in just a minute, they're going to get in a whooping lot of trouble because of that. So here's the deal. You know, where, where Jesus went, especially at this time in his ministry, there were lots of people around Jesus. I mean, he would go around, he'd draw a crowd. And uh, the, the sick would come trying to get healed from him. Those who want to hear about the kingdom of God and listen to this guy who looks like a prophet and sounds like a prophet, but maybe he's so much more than that. Uh, so that it would gather quite a crowd. And uh, if you're wondering how big a crowd, think the feeding of the 5,000 and stuff like that. There would be as many people as could cram into a place. So here it's like standing room only, reserved seating. People are just coming to Jesus and then all of a sudden, here's these parents that are kind of pushing their kids sort of in front, hoping that Jesus will touch them. And, and the apostles say, hey, hey, this is not the place for them. They need to know their place, and this is not the place for them. So, so the disciples rebuked them. The disciples rebuked them. And he, by the way, by the way the Greek is written, it doesn't say he rebuked the children. It rebuked them that brought the children. Is the way it's, so the kids aren't freaked out, but the parents are definitely freaked out. So what is it? Jesus is standing right there, and he's at this He's at this interesting place. I need to decide. Do I need to take this time that I have with this larger crowd and tell them about the kingdom of heaven? And really, I don't want to waste this time because this is critical. He may have only known he had three years to really communicate this stuff, but every minute in Jesus' economy is really valuable. So do I stop what I'm doing talking about the kingdom of heaven or do somehow I do this thing with the kids? So, let me put it to you for a second. If you're the Messiah, the king, who's only got three years to talk to people about the kingdom of heaven and change their minds about everything they've ever thought about before and have this incredibly difficult, by the way, ministry of telling people they're wrong, <laughs> what do you do? Do you take time out with the kids or do you just keep going? Keep going. Take time with the kids. Trick question. <laughs> Well, we know what happens. He spends time with the kids. But, but you have to understand, if you or I were in his shoes, this would be a tough choice. Because if you, if you detour in what you're teaching about, it could mean the salvation of some of the people in this crowd. This is a big deal. He's, he's not just wasting his time talking to people. It's a big deal. And so when he stops and does what he does next, he does it very carefully considered. And it shows the value of the children. Here's what he does. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, I just want to stop right there. 
you can't get a more powerful word than indignant right there. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's righteous anger. I forget the Greek word right now. Oh, he wants more Greek. Okay, I'll bring some more Greek next week, Steve. But, it's, but, I, but I looked at it. It's a very forceful, very indignant kind of anger thing. It's, a, it's the kind of thing that, that you would see in other places where there would be an injustice in your sight, and as you're watching this injustice, it just makes you indignant. That's just wrong. So have you ever been in a situation where you see something go down that's just wrong, and you say, that's, that's just wrong, and, the, and you can feel the heat kind of rising, and the anger has nothing to do about you. It has everything to do about the injustice visit on somebody else. And so as the apostles are getting in the way of these children coming in, Jesus starts to get righteously angry. At the kids? No. At the parents? No. In this case, we're pretty sure the apostles. <laughs> it's the equivalent of Jesus turning the apostles and saying, what do you think you're doing when these kids are coming up? And they, you know, we don't know what their response was. I, I always have envisioned in my I have like a movie player in my head. I see this in a movie. I see the apostles taking a couple steps back when Jesus gets angry at them, and they just kind of slink into the crowd and kind of go away. <laughs> I mean, it's really a very forceful, it's a strong rebuke to them. Now, to be fair, Jesus doesn't want to just scare the apostles and say, let them in here and stop doing that. You guys go away. He explains it to them in the next couple words. He explains why, why he's angry. And here's what he says. He says, permit the children to come to me. Don't hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Wow. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So here's, here's how the perception of the apostles is all screwed up. They're thinking in this large crowd that the kingdom, this kingdom of God, belongs to whoever in the crowd is listening to the words of Jesus and treasures the word of Jesus and changes because of the words of Jesus. And that's true. That's true. But what they don't understand is that there is something about the nature of children that the kingdom of God already belongs to them. And if you, that is the listening crowd and you apostles, if you don't take your advice, in a sense, pick up what these children are doing in, in Jesus' presence, you're missing the bigger part of the question, the bigger part of the picture. You're missing it. You're missing it. You know that whole scene in, uh, uh, in, in Hook? Remember that kind of new version of, of Peter Pan? It was years ago. It was in the mid-'80s that came out. Dustin Hoffman, all that kind of stuff. But anyway, there is one spot where, where the wife tells a husband who is this big, highfalutin, accomplished businessman who's never at home. He says, you're just missing it. The childhood of, the, of your children, you're just missing it. Well, Jesus is saying it right here to these guys, you're missing it. The point of me being here is as much for them as it is for them. And that's just an astonishing statement. It's astonishing. It's even more astonishing when you understand the culture back then. In the culture back then, there was a pecking order in terms of who was important in a culture, Okay. And, and the pecking order started with the religious leaders, not Rome, with the religious leaders, way up here, big toots that walked around with big robes, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you had the religious leaders. And then when you get down to villages, then you have the leaders, the, the society leaders in a village. And then when you got from that point down, then you started getting that, the leaders of the household, the men in the household. And then when you go down one spot after that, then you get the women. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Leaders of household, cattle, no kidding, women, Children, shepherds. Whoops, sorry. Shepherds. That was kind of the pecking order during that time. Which is why it's interesting that when Jesus is born, the first people who get the telegram are shepherds, the lowest guy. But women and cho children are just right next to the bottom. Children have almost no value at all. In their society, the children didn't have value until they did something worthwhile. Then they had value. That's that, that boasting thing again. It says, no. Children. So he's taken this entire address to all these people and said, I want to address the people who are not respected at all in this culture. I want to talk to the kids. I want to talk to the kids. And it's his reaction to them that I think is, this is the part that I just love. He took them in his arms and he began blessing them, laying his hands on them. The other two Gospels don't mention this. And right here you see not only the fact that Jesus is investing in the future of these kids, which he is doing to a certain degree, but he actually enjoys it. 
He enjoys it. He takes him in his arms and he blesses him. There is, in the way we're designed as mothers and fathers, there is a very natural inbred sense of enjoying our kids. Now, they get to be 12, that changes again, but we still enjoy them. We still love them. Now, I have kids in their 30s. I love them to death. In fact, they're, they're better now than they were when they were 12, for sure. But anyway, <laughs> you love them. But you know what? When, the, when children come in the scene and you love them, you go, this is the best thing ever, ever. The best thing ever. Now, if God built that in about you and you're just an earthly parent, if he wants us to call him father, what do you think his delight is when he embraces us? Because he made this to be a reflection of that. And so here you have the creator of everything sitting there in this split second where everything comes to a stop. The clock freezes for a split second and he brings kids up to him. And what does he do? Does he lecture them? Now, son, you need to go home and respect your dad because your dad, after all, he knows what he's doing even though he looks like he might be an idiot. And your mom, too. I think your, mom, your mom's baking for you. Every, you need to go home and thank them. For, does he lecture them? Doesn't look like he lectures them. I would have lectured them. I would have sat him down in the semicircle. Thanks for bringing all the kids and you kids, you just sit right here. I've got a special kid's message for you today. You need to honor your father and your mother that's one of the Ten Commandments. Do this, and it'll be a great blessing to you, okay? Has everyone got that? Okay, let's sing a song. Bye. <laughs> but he takes him in his arms and he blesses him. I think that's one of the most profound statements in the entire New Testament. And that's his reaction to you. It says, we looked at it last week, that in the kingdom, uh, that we are adopted children into the kingdom, into God's family. We're adopted children. We weren't natural children at all. We weren't spiritual children of his. We were actually, Paul says in Ephesians, we were children of wrath. That's where we come from. That's our status. But then with the blood of Jesus, we're adopted into his family. And at that point, oh, the, the love of God to you, the Father, is beyond bounds. Paul writes this so many times, I wish you understood the love that God has for you. It's length and it's depth and it's breadth and it's width and it's height. Yeah, it's four. I want you to know how big that love of God is for you. And the love that you find from your parents, it's just a small fraction pointed to the love that God has for you. So when the apostles come to Jesus and Jesus teaches how to pray, Jesus says, I'll teach you how to pray. You know how you need to pray? Our Father who's in heaven. Exactly. Our Father. And he doesn't say the Father. It's possessive. Our Father. My Father. My Father. Yeah, that's... And so here you have this loving Father who's trying to get it through our thick skulls that he loves us tremendously. Just loves us tremendously. How do I know that? Because he gave me a model to understand it. Since I've become a dad, I understand that. I've had a dad and a mom myself. I understand that. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. If we love like that, how much more can God's love be for us? Jesus puts it another way, too. He says, you know, when you pray, when you're praying, he says, should you, should you pray? Is God going to actually listen to your prayers? I mean, after all, he's way out there, and you're down here, and you're in the middle of all this stuff that kind of, and he's way out there, and, you're, and he's running the universe, and you're, uh, do you want to hear your prayers? And Jesus comes back with a great answer. He says, listen, if you come to your own father and you ask him over and over again for something, doesn't he, doesn't he give you a good thing because of his love for you? I mean, even us fallen bad fathers will still give good things to our children when they ask. So if rotten fathers will do that, what do you think your father in heaven will do when you ask him? That's how much he loves you. That's why the whole children thing is a big deal. He's trying to tell you something about what your relationship with our Father ought to be like. Okay. I uh, made a list at this point. Here's my list. This is kind of like my, well, I don't want to say my New Year's resolution list, but I asked myself as I was thinking and praying through this week, I, I just read all those passages about Jesus. By the way, you've seen all the passages except for the parallel ones that Jesus does with kids. That's, that's it. Um, but if, if I'm supposed to be more like them, how do I need to be more like them? And it, for me, it wasn't enough for me just to say, well, I need to humble myself, and I need to be less proud, and quit arguing with people about how accomplished I am. No, it goes far deeper than that. And so I was thinking more about the humility of children. And you can make your own list from these passages. This is the list that I made for myself. You can use it too. I don't care. 
But for me, these were the areas in my life where I said, I need to be more like kids this way, that the humility of kids this way. And, and the reason I need to do this is not because it's good for me, but because this is what draws me closer in a relationship with my father. Because no matter how old you get, and some of us are getting on in years, I won't make any eye contact, you still have a father, a father in heaven. So, and you're still a child. So there's a real sense in which to, to build this child-father relationship, I need to get off my high horse and quit doing da 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 Well, this is my list of things I, I want God to change in me. So let me just illustrate what I'm talking about right here. Trusting. Um, children are incredibly trusting, again, up to a certain age. But they're incredibly trusting. They wake up in the morning. They don't worry about where the food's going to come from. It's just always there, you know. They don't worry about, you know, whether there's going to be heat on the house because there's always heat in the house. They don't worry about They don't worry about anything. They just know, I have parents. They provide for me. Life is great. Now, when you get older and become an adult, those things start to actually become threats to you. But as a child, you just trust that the loving parents are going to do it for you. And they do. They're very faithful about it. Well, in a certain way, I'm not like that with God all the time. Let me, let me show you. For instance, I did this in a uh, kind of a dialogue kind of way. This is what happens when I do it wrong. This is the bad side. Hey, I got this. Stand back. Watch the pro. That's me. I got this. Okay, here we go. This is, there's this kind of cocky sense of self-dependence and ability to do things and no dependence at all. It's a growing independence, not a growing dependence on God. Now, I can do many things, and, and I'm just being <coughs> humble with you <laughs> on the level. But there is so much that goes on in life that I can't handle. I really can't handle. But many times, I still rush right into him and say, oh, <coughs> I can do this. I'm ready. And there's no dependence on God at all, no dependence on a father who wants to provide and wants to protect and do all the things a father does. What I need to do instead, like a child, is do something that looks more like this. Father, you have been so faithful. Work through me to accomplish your best in this situation. So instead of going in there with my sword drawn and capable to do all those kinds of things, and I am capable on a certain level, and I'll get engaged on that level, but really what I need to go in and say is say, God, take it. I'm here. Use me. Use all the talents you've given me. Use everything else. But, but I'm probably prone, not, not probably, I am prone to do in this situation what I think is best. And that's where you start to screw up. That's where you're really not capable. Because in God's economy, what's best in that situation is something he understands. He says, my ways are not your ways. Come on. My ways are higher than yours. So to go in independence, and I think that's, that's a real big deal. A, a childlike life in Christ is a life of continual dependence and growing dependence in every moment. And not just saying, well, God, you know what? I got this stuff, uh, and I can do all this stuff over here. But, you know, the rest of my life, I, I can't deal with this. So, God, I got this. You do this. It's not a matter of trying to draw a line between what I can handle and what he can handle. It's more a matter, like a child, of saying, well, you need to do all this for me, and you can use me over here, and you're giving me some talents. But there's still, there's still a sense of dependence in every way upon him because it's what you don't see that gets in the way when you think, oh, God, I got this. i got to stop saying that. God, I got this. You can go away for a while. No. A child is dependent in every way. How about this middle one? Teachable. Teachable. Now, you're probably thinking, my kids aren't teachable. <laughs> ah, but kids are remarkably teachable. They're remarkably moldable. And as I mentioned earlier in the baby dedication, they're more moldable by what you do rather than what you say. And it's, and it's unconscious, too. I mean, you unconsciously, as parents, do certain things that you imprint upon your kids because they're watching you. And suddenly, it's like a copy has happened. And, it's, and, and they don't even know what happened to them. You live in close proximity, parents and children, and they're teachable. It's, a better word might be actually moldable. Children are very moldable. They start off kind of like blank slates, and then they watch you as parents their entire upbringing. And it prints whether you like it or not. That's why it's so hard to, to change a child's behavior based on what you say if your own behavior is wrong. Your behavior is what teaches. I was just spooked out this week doing something, and I heard my dad speaking. <laughs> and it was me. It was me saying, and he never taught me. He didn't sit me down and say, now, son, when you get into this situation, what you need to say is this, you need to use this inflection of voice. No, it just imprints. It just imprints. 
There's a powerful connection between parents and children. And parents, the best thing you can do to teach your children is for you to be changed by God himself. That's just a gigantic issue. It's gigantic. And don't say, well, I'm going to live like this, but I want something better for my kids. So I'll tell my kids the way they should live, but I'm going to still do this. Yeah, it just doesn't work. Because actually they grew up hating you because they realize you're a hypocrite. I have parents who are hypocrites. So here's, here's how this kind of works out for me. Many times I'll say, hey, you're wrong. I should know. I've read every book on this, even the Bible. I know. That's a very unteachable spirit right there. That's a know-it-all kind of spirit. I have a horrible tendency to do this, especially when I'm right most of the time. No, I'm not right most of the time. But there's a sense in which I feel like I know and I don't need to know anymore. And God frequently says, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know how big the don't knowing you have that you don't know. That's how clueless you are. You do know some things. And I'm not saying the things you know are useless. They're useful because God has worked to teach those things to you. But don't get all uppity about it. There's a ton you don't know. So even in the midst of knowing many things, and as we get older, we accumulate knowledge and wisdom. And if you read Proverbs, that's a good thing. I'm not saying throw all that away. All I'm saying is, is don't get all uppity about it and think you've done, you're done. You're, you're not done. We're all teachable if we're childlike. So instead, you should see something like this. Well, I might be wrong, but this is how I see it. Tell me how you see it. That's a teachable comment in the midst of talking about a topic. I see it, I see it this way. This is the way I, you know, there's nothing wrong with the way I see it. But wh- wh- where are you coming from? Tell me, listen. That's a teachable spirit. Or maybe something more like this. Father, give me true understanding. Your ways are not my ways. So you can think you understand something. I'm constantly telling myself, Jim, you may not know everything in this. So I go to God and say, God, I I know this. I know these three things. What am I missing? I want to be teachable. I want to be taught by you. Use use your insight into the situation and lead me because I'm clueless. This comes up most often when I'm counseling people. And people who come to someone to be counseled think that the person they're getting counseled from knows more than they do. And often, people will come into my office and talk to me, and the prayer in my heart is, God, I don't know what to say to these people. This is, this is like way over my head. But you have put me here with them. You've put your spirit in me. I'm open to however you lead right here, but you need to teach me before I can counsel because I, I don't know. I don't know. And the, the miraculous thing is, is he always comes through every time. Every single time. I'll come home and, 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 and share some stuff with Dorothy and, and say, you know, I was in this situation and I found myself saying, which is kind of an out-of-body experience when you listen to that language. <laughs> I found myself saying, I was listening to myself and in the same time I'm listening to myself saying it, I'm saying, well, where did that come from? That just came from the prayer I did five minutes before. So God is willing, if you act as a child, to be teachable rather than a know-it-all and say, God, teach me. I, I don't know. I don't know. And he, and he loves to come in and say, let me tell you. The women right now are studying through Proverbs. That book is specifically intended to fix the wisdom and knowledge gap that we have. To actually come to God and say, God, psh, I know a few things, but on this I'm clueless. Or many, many, many things. I don't know how much I don't know that I don't know. So I need you to teach me. And he does. And the writer of Proverbs takes wisdom and puts it up on a pedestal and says, that's more valuable than gold right there. You need to understand you don't have it all yet. That's a teachable spirit. That, that's all we're saying with children. And they're teachable. Okay. Transparent. Um, let me just do this. You'll see what I'm talking about. In the bad side, I'd say, well, what will they think of me if I speak up? I better claim up. Have you ever been in that situation? You're kind of guarded. You don't want to you want to speak because if you speak, you'll let your ignorance be revealed? So I better not say anything because if I don't say anything, then they'll realize that I'm actually clueless on this. And I want them to understand or think that I'm not clueless on this. So I better not say anything or else they'll understand the true me. So you don't say anything. Or something like this. If they only knew. So, so as adults, as non-children... Uh, this, this game of moving away from the humble basis Jesus says we're supposed to come from, what we do as adults is we're constantly grooming our exterior so people don't see our interior. 
And so you're always very guarded about what you say and what you do because you would prefer that they believe something that's not true about you and hence save your reputation. Am I alone in this? I'm getting vacant stares. But this is what we do as adults. We protect, we <laughs> we protect our reputations. We're not very transparent. We're very guarded most of the time. We're not transparent. But you know what? Kids are remarkably transparent, especially when the young ones. They'll just, they'll just let you know. They're, they're just right there. They are what they are. They always are, and they'll let you know all the time. They're so transparent that they see through you and tell you what you look like all the time. One of my biggest, one of my biggest revelations when I went into youth ministry, which is the first thing I did when I left industry and went into ministry, one of the first revelations I had was the fact that teenagers... 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, teenagers are incredibly insightful about the true nature of human beings. Now, you're probably thinking, no, nah, I don't think so. They're the goofiest things on earth. Not, you know, if I, was, if I was ingenuine and guarded in any situation, they'd call me on it. They'd call me on it and say, no, Jim, it's like this. You go, ah, what, is my door open? How do you know that? How do you know that? Very insightful. And on top of that, they're brutal when it comes to reacting to um, uh, fronts and falsehoods that you put on. So adults, I got to tell you, if you think you're successfully protecting a reputation by putting on a front, they got you nailed. They know. They just know. And so you know what I figured out the most valuable tool for was, was for me in, in youth ministry? Be incredibly transparent. And they loved that. And you know what? I loved that. Really. It was incredible. When you become transparent, they become transparent. There's, there's great candidness about the nature of life. And I found out that there's a whole world of youth out there who are looking for someone they can have a candid conversation about the hard things in life. So when I started that, they talked. It's incredible. It's like being a child. It's like being a child. What should you say instead? I am what I am, and that's why I need Jesus. I love that phrase. I mean, I'm, I'm done trying to protect, trying to give you a different image of who I am. I am who I am, and that's why I need Jesus. And he's changing me every day. In fact, that's the second phrase I love right here. Be patient. God's not finished with me yet. <laughs> so when I expose a part of who I am, and I say, you know, that's ugly and that's unrefined and that part of me is boy I sure need some work I say yes I agree with you that needs work but he's working on me slowly I can give you a list of how he's changed me in the past thank God incredible things he's done in my life but this I'd sure still love to get rid of this but he's working on that you see it I see it there it is instead of holding it closed all the time transparency like a child that's also a dependency issue like on the very first thing the trusting I'm trusting that if I reveal these things about me, that I'm candid about who I am, it will be returned with love in the body of Christ and not with arrows. Now, there's no guarantee arrows don't come. They, they do, actually. Because the problem is, is when we get back to this hierarchical thinking about what the church is like and the kingdom of God, people start acting like my worthiness and my protected image is an important thing. And so if you expose yours, I can notch myself up a few more times because Jim's being honest about who he really is. And that happens in churches, every church, every group of people. In the kingdom of God, Jesus says, you got to be like a child. No one can do that. We, we are who we are. And he loves us nevertheless. God's working on me slowly, so be patient with me and I'll be patient with you. That's a very childlike attitude of trust in the one who's changing us. And it's not an adult attitude of prideful positioning and hierarchy. It's a refreshing thing not to have to be your own best PR department. <sighs> Just be who you are. Lastly, timeless. Timeless? Well, it starts to come from, you know how when you were 12 or 13 or 14, you thought you'd never die? I still don't think I will. <laughs> well, I will probably. But this is, this is bigger than that. Let me, let me just show you. I'll illustrate it. You ever had an adult or you say this? I'm way busy. Don't have time for this. I can remember hearing this as a child over and over and over again. 
I mean, just, I just had a simple want to be with you kind of thing. And the adult would say, you know, I'm busy. I'm busy right now. I have other things to do. I'm scheduled someplace else. You know, blah, 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 blah. I'm way busy. I just don't have time for this. What's the this? Me as a child. I don't have time for you. I got bigger things to do. Or this one right here is, do you have any idea how behind I am? This is, this is how an adult says, closes the doors and says, go away. And they use time as the issue. Now, time is not a phony issue. We, we only have so much time. And when you get to be an adult, you start rationing that time very carefully. I mean, you, you really understand time is short. And the older you get, time is shorter. And so that, that, whole, that whole mythical idea back when you're a teenager that you'll never die and you'll be eternal somehow. And you just don't, but, you know, time gets to be very, very short. And adults tend to isolate themselves because time is short. But look what Jesus did in that group of people. He only had a three-year ministry. Clock is ticking to get things done. Ticking. He's been, Jesus has been kind of doing all these things to push off a premature angering by the religious leaders. You see him do it over and over again. So it doesn't become, you know, the fuse doesn't get lit too quickly and his three years becomes, you know, 18 months instead. Time's precious. And Jesus says, this is more precious. I'm going to hug a child one at a time and bless them. <gasps> Why? Because this is living. It's one of the best uses of time is living, is living, not doing. And I think that's the, that's the difference between children and adults. Adults think the best use of time is doing and accomplishing, and children know the best use of time is living. Don't you miss that? Instead, what I should be saying is stuff like this. In fact, this is a quote for me I did just this last week. I was outside. I said, Father, your sunset makes these mountains beautiful. I'm just going to stop and watch the whole show until you're finished. And I stood there. I think the neighbors thought, but what's he doing? I just, oh. When was the last time you did that? And I was busy. I had things to do and people to see and places to go and all, blah, 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 all these adult things, you know, and all these adult time things are coming in. But I stopped and thought, you know what? There's life right here. I'm going to soak some of this up because I see this as a gift from God. I'm going to soak this up. In that sense, it's kind of timeless because you, you take all those other time demands and they're real demands, but you just kind of push them aside just for a split second because you know what? Adults, five minutes watching Pink Mountains is not going to screw up your schedule. And Jesus says, a few minutes hugging kids is not going to screw up this schedule either. That's a real childlike timelessness. Um, or this one. This is an actual quote for me, and I'll tell you the story in a second. Father, she just needs someone to sit with her. It's what you've done with me. This came from when I was, um, the first couple of years of college, I was living at home with my parents, and there was a little girl that lived on our cul-de-sac, probably about 11 or 12. And she was, she was, um, um, mentally slow. I don't really know a way to say this, but she, um, be, because she was slow in that sense, she had a hard time connecting with kids in that cul-de-sac to play with. And all they wanted to do was play. And there was, there was like six, eight kids out there all the time doing different kinds of things. And she could never get incorporated because she was different. You know? And she was also a pest. <laughs> she, she was so desperate for attention that anybody Anybody who, was, who stopped long enough, she'd, she'd come right up to. And that, so that's why the other kids didn't want her to be around because she was a pest. She'd just latch on to them and she didn't really know how to do the give and take of fun of playing and stuff like that. She was just there to kind of suck the relationship out of this person in a sense. So she was sort of a pest that way. And, and she'd go from person to person and she did that with me a few times. Here I am, you know, in my, in my late teens, early 20s and I'm thinking I don't have time for her. Well, one day um, I'm at home I look through the garage, and, uh, and I see out onto the street in the cul-de-sac, and here she is sitting on the sidewalk in front of our house, just sitting on the sidewalk, and not another kid in sight, not another human being in sight. And from the back, all I could see was she was sitting on the curb, and her head was hung down, and I saw, I saw her chest heaving like this, so I knew she was crying, just all by herself on our curb. And, uh, and at that point, you know, the compassion sort of comes out of you, but my first impression as an adult was, I'm on my way to doing other things. <laughs> I've got this thing I'm doing. And so I really got to keep moving. And anyway, she's a pest. If I show her any attention, she's just going to latch onto me as a pest. And, but I have these other things. And God very clearly said, what is your problem? 
why don't you just go sit with her? Maybe she just wants someone to sit with. And so I said, Father, she just needs someone to sit with her. And that's what you've done with me. It was going to be, it was going to take out my time as an adult. It was going to mess up my schedule for what I was doing. I was in the middle of doing something. But God just says, come on, Jim, five minutes. Can, can that mess up your day? I went out and I sat with her. I sat down next to her and she didn't say a word. She, she re- literally didn't say a word. And all I said was, hi. And I sat down. And I sat there with her for five minutes. And then she stopped crying. And she smiled at me. And she got up and she crossed the street and went to her house. And I remember thinking, God, was that worth anything? Was that, was that really worth anything? Did I just lose five minutes that I'll never get back? Back just longer than five. It's probably closer to 10 or 15 minutes. It was very awkward sitting there with this little girl not saying a thing, just sitting there on the curb in the sun, looking around. About, uh, about a year later, her mom came to me and she said, she said, thanks, thanks for that thing that you did with my daughter. A year later. And I said, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> and all I could think of was pest. Oh, we're so messed up. And she says, no, she, she, you sat down on the curb with her one day and you just sat with her, right? I said, oh, yeah, that was like... Psh- a year ago. She says, well, she talks about it all the time. She talks about it all the time. Where she, and she said, I get it. She didn't have a friend in the world. She was completely alone. There was nobody around. She wasn't even sitting on our curb. She was just sitting on any curb. And then you just came down and sat next to her. And she says, she's never stopped talking about it. Wow. I, I didn't even say anything profound. I just sat with her. By the way, you can do that. Yes, you did yourself. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's an attitude of losing the adult, time-driven kind of thing. We do have responsibilities. I'm not putting those down. We do have demands on our time. I'm not putting that down. We do have to use our time wisely. But a child understands what it's like to see life and to engage life. Where we as adults tend to say, I'm way too busy. You know how behind I am? And just running off and missing life, missing it all together. You miss the sunsets. You miss the little kids you can just sit with. You miss the people who just need a very simple, kind word. You miss all those things of life. And at the end of life, I think one of the most tragic things that can happen is you can say, I hit all my deadlines. I got all my accomplishments done. Look what I got done. And then God will say, but you missed so much. If you'd just been five minutes like a child, you'd go, God, what a sunset. I'm going to wait this out until you're done. Look at that. So there's a timelessness with children that we need to pick up that we as adults, we lose. Dorothy says often that one of my chief characteristics is I'm playful. <laughs> and if you know me at all, you know that that's kind of true. But, but for me, playfulness is a way of looking around and saying, is there life here? Yeah, let's go over here and do something. And you, and, you, and you play, you enjoy the situation that you're in. And you don't ever say, I don't have time for this because God said, yes, you do. Do this. And so it's fun. There's so much in this creation that God has put here for us to delight us, not just the physical creation, but the people that are around, to delight us. And this is where you pick up on the take when Jesus is with these little kids and in Mark 10, he holds them one at a time and blesses them and says, this is right here. Yeah. Slow down. So I would encourage you to make your own list. Go back and look at those passages. They're, they're, they're incredible in terms of understanding that when Jesus was saying you need to be like children, he himself, in a real sense, was being like a child in those circumstances. Being less like an adult and more like a child. Being childish, No, being a son of God. And for us, that's what we need to reinforce. Being children of God. I mean, he's adopted you into his family. He loves you tremendously. You'll never, ever run out of the space and the dimensions of understanding his love for you. And he's placed around you so many opportunities to be a child in dependency on him that will bless you that you miss because you say, well, after all, I'm a grown-up. Can't do that anymore. So I still have uh, snowball fights. I still like to do snow forts. I don't build any of these days. 
But I look at them on the internet, and they're incredible. And one of these days, I'm going to build a snow fort like that one. I'm going to, because that would be just a blast and a half. And I'm going to sit in that snow fort with a snow cover on top, and I'm going to have a little light right here and a little fire and say, ah, I'm in a snow fort. This is living. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for your great loving kindness to us and how you put all around us life. And forgive us, Lord, when we, when we uh, pass by life. We make the excuse that we're adults and we can no longer do that kind of a thing. But Lord, I pray that more than anything else, that you would, in this new year in all of us, that you would cultivate in us this, this wonder of dependency on you, our Father. And that we would come to you frequently, continually as children, not know-it-alls or self-dependent, but dependent on you and hungry for your presence and for your care in our lives. And that as we do that, as we draw near to you, that you will draw near to us as you promise in your word. And that our relationship with you as our Father would culminate in us being...